Hey podcast, so today I'm speaking to Annie Soderberg. Is that you pronounce your name by the way? Yeah, that's good. Nailed it, first time. So I'm speaking to Annie Soderberg. She's 30 years old, uh, happy birthday by the way, it was about two weeks ago, <laughs> as she's the former longtime head coach of the Swedish national MTB team. She recently returned to her professional sports psychologist profession to work with all kinds of athletes from many different sports. She's also a keen racer herself and she just finished racing the first ever Red Bull World Pump Track Worlds this weekend, that's so hard to say. <laughs> she's been mountain biking since 98 and has podiumed in several disciplines from BMX to Enduro. So today we're really going to be diving into the mental side of mountain biking and the mental side of things is fascinating to me to be honest i know if you've been following the podcast for a while you know i love talking about all that kind of stuff um so i'm really excited for this so thank you for coming on annie yeah thank you for having me (laughs) no it's gonna be good i'm looking forward to it so i think a great way to start would be for you to tell us a bit more about your past so you've been mountain biking since 98 is that right uh yeah Uh, sorry i just have to turn my sound on (laughs) Uh, I've been mountain biking since 98 that's when uh, I think my brother started two years earlier than I did and uh, since I did everything that he did I had to do mountain biking as well okay and so we began we were like four four or five kids in the the local club back then and uh, now I think there are over 100 people that meet every Monday and uh, Thursday here so it's grown a lot since I began and uh, I began with cross-country mountain biking. Uh, that was the only thing we had in Örebro, where I'm from. Uh, so it was it was the easiest step to get into the sport. But after that, I've tried most disciplines with two wheels. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you've done a lot, haven't you? I noticed it was like road cycling and BMX and mountain biking and everything. <laughs> yeah, I think I started with road cycling uh, two years after I started with the mountain biking. Because there were more uh, girls that raced in uh, road cycling. So I wanted to have a bigger sport than the, the fun sport. <laughs> <because> <laughs> with each other. Yeah. So did you kind of, how long was it before you started racing then? Obviously you got into mountain biking. Did you start racing straight away or was it kind of uh, further down the line? I think I almost started straight away since we had in our in the training we were racing for fun and it was quite natural to just go to the small events. Uh, we had small races in our town and then neighbor towns, so it was a just a fun part of mountain biking. I don't know if I thought about it as racing in the beginning. Okay. I just thought of it like biking as fast as I could. <laughs> <laughs> back it as fast as you could and try to beat everyone else exactly. <laughs> I bet that took a bit of the pressure off though yeah yeah probably <laughs> but it was uh, I came from uh, swimming I'd been competing in swimming before uh, and mountain biking from the beginning felt like more of, more like playing and having fun okay uh, like the swimming was just like going straight ahead as fast as you could <laughs> and mountain <laughs> biking just be a little freer and uh, have a little fun with technique and such. Of course. So how did you end up working with the Swedish national team then? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> 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 no, just, uh, sometimes when I think about it, it feels like it's been like a straight road from... Uh, from- as the fifth witness cyclist and uh, yeah all the things around the competitions so I was with him a few years uh, and then uh, when he finished his work at the federation I got uh, got asked if I were interested in in his spot so I I, I searched for it <laughs> I <tried. laughs> 
<laughs> oh, amazing. So were you working on kind of like the whole training and nutrition and the mindset? Was it like a bit of everything or was it kind of one specific kind of niche that you worked on with your athletes? Uh, from the beginning, it was a bit of everything since uh, the the program that I was in at the university is quite wide. It's broad and it's, uh, it's different um, fields. Uh, I... I knew I was always interested in the sports psychology uh, and the, the mental side of racing, but uh, as as teams are built uh, in mountain bike, there are not a lot of uh, money and resources, so it's good that you know a multidisciplinary. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. Talk to other other people in your team, and you can tape a foot, and you can talk about anxiety. It's good to have a little bit of knowledge in a lot of things. That's very kind of similar to what I do with MTB Fitness, but with you, it's kind of working with pro athletes, whereas for me, I kind of work with the 95% of the everyday rider. But I'm kind of the same. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm the best in the world. Uh, anything like the best in the world at like nutrition or training or psychology or any of that but I like to try and blend them all so like my, you know one day a Facebook post in the morning will be about nutrition and then the evening will be about training and then there'll be a podcast that's about the mindset um, and I think especially for like your everyday rider try just getting like a real good understanding of all of those things will really really help and um, so yeah it's a kind of a similar approach yeah for, I think for me it's helped a lot since I continued on studying after my first degree. I continued in psychotherapy and CBT for uh, elite athletes and uh, okay. started working as a sports psychologist after that. Uh, and uh, since I know a little bit, bit about the other parts also, it's easier to talk to like the physiotherapists and the coaches yeah. to understand an athlete in other levels also, not just one, but my speciality is sports psychology stuff. Yeah, of course. So which is your which uh, aspect do you prefer? Is your favorite the sports psychology or do you like them all equally? I like athletes. <laughs> okay, so just athletes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I prefer sports psychology. It's uh, definitely where I, I'm, I search the most. I'm mostly interested in. Uh, so uh, that's that's what I I dig into more, but uh, I like the holistic per, uh, perspective when you think about sports. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I like it. I suppose when you lay on the sofa at night and you've got your phone, you kind of know what you're most interested in when it's what you're Googling, isn't it? And what you're reading about when you're kind of not working at all. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy when you're interested in a field. Too. For sure. Yeah. So when I was Facebook stalking you and Instagram stalking you this morning, <laughs> I was at my local coffee shop trying to get as much information as possible. I saw that a couple of months back, you got your mum back into riding and she's not ridden in years, actually. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> she's actually not a mountain biker at all. Uh, okay. But um, I got her to do downhill for the first time, I think, three years ago. Uh, and that okay. was super fun. Uh, she says it was super scary and uh, we had a little bit of a talk when she tried to explain it was hard to go uphill <laughs> in the downhill and I was like there are no uphills <laughs> it's downhill but she <laughs> about the, the jumps when it went uh, oh, okay I was like ah okay you pedal there I understand your problem <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you shouldn't be pedaling that bit <laughs> yeah, it's super cool I'm actually really impressed by what she's uh, done it's not every mom that haven't done mountain biking at all that would come with their crazy kid to the downhill park so <laughs> my mom would definitely not do that <laughs> she'd be scared enough like just going on a tow path <laughs> yeah, uh, so actually since uh, my brother is cycling as well um, and my parents weren't into cycling at all uh, we've tried i think a few times to get them on the bikes but they haven't really stuck yet <laughs> like, you keep trying yeah how old is she mom sorry we both spoke at the same time then how old is she mom uh she turned 60 this year so oh, that's amazing yeah. nice <laughs> yeah so there's so many questions around that but i think one one thing that i was thinking so 
and I find I get questions all day long, like all the time. But I find that people who are often really shy to ask questions are the beginners. So either they'll be shy to reach out to me directly and ask a question because it's a stupid question, or I have a Facebook group with a lot of members, and beginners are almost like if they do post a question, they'll be apologising for asking almost, uh, and they feel quite shy to ask. So when you think about complete mountain bike beginners and complete novices, and um, particularly on kind of like the mental side and the sports psychology side. What are some tips that spring to mind for the beginner mountain bikers listening to this? Mm, uh, I think that trying something new is always both and both exciting, but also brings uh, your nerves to jitter a bit. And uh, sometimes uh, I meet beginners that are more afraid of losing their face than actually crashing like if you're with a group of people you don't want to be the worst rider and you feel that everyone is waiting for you and you feel sorry for them uh, and it's a lot of like mind reading <laughs> you read you read the other people's in the group's minds and think that you know how they feel about your riding so <laughs> i think that the first approach would be uh, to try to not downsize yourself in that uh, moment just by uh, knowing that you were invited to the ride because they want you there uh, in the shape that you are in and in in the technical <laughs> theory you're in so i think the first thing would be like recognize if you are mind reading someone because i don't know what you're thinking at the, for the moment i might yeah. think no but i don't <laughs> That's so true. And that's something that I find a lot of people. And, and you know what? That's probably not even a beginner thing as well. That spreads to all like, you know, could there be people riding for 10 years. We we do a social ride probably every three, four months. And I always get questions. There'll be people who've ridden for 10 years, but they're afraid to ride in a group. And they're always like, can I come? I'm really slow. And it's like, of course you can come. It's fine. Uh, and you're exactly right. You said if people are inviting you to ride, they know how fit you are and they know that it's going to be a slower ride. Like I'll ride with my dad and my dad probably only rides once every couple of weeks, something like that. So from a fitness point of view, like there's no real comparison. Like I don't have a good workout when I'm riding my dad, but when I'm riding my dad, I'm going with the mindset that I'm going to have a nice ride with my dad. <laughs> so I'm not going to try and get fitter. I'm going because I enjoy it. Um, and I think in groups, like you said it exactly right. Most people don't care if you're first or last or if they have to wait on the hill because if they're riding with you and they've ridden more than once with you before they know going in what kind of pace the ride's going to be at and those who want a super hard ride can they'll probably do that on a saturday and then ride with you on a sunday or whatever and um, so yeah i think that's a really really good tip uh, have you got any more for beginners <laughs> i'm gonna put you on the spot so much over the next like yeah. half an hour <laughs> i have to put my mind where i where i think that the beginners are at um, I don't know. It, it, it depends on what the struggle is, I think. If you're a beginner that has a tough time just getting out, uh, maybe it's uh, because your preparations aren't there. And if you're a beginner that wants to go riding all the time, every day, and you get ill instead because you do it too much, you have to get to know yourself just before. It's hard for me to give like tips in general. Uh, okay. so we're all so much different in how we like to ride. And uh, I bet that you as a beginner were different than I were. I know that uh, I had a real hard time like clipping in the pedals and I was like, I'm going to die if I clip in my pedals. <laughs> <laughs> that was for me, but I was when I was seven, eight, something, nine years when I started and I had never been clipped in. So it's natural to be scared for something that is new. Uh, and when you understand that it's natural to feel anxious about something you don't know, uh, it's less stigma in that too. It's like, it's okay to be nervous instead of saying you can't be nervous now, you, you're a bad rider because you're nervous. <laughs> yeah, I so. agree. There's so many things that we could talk about in that. And I've got tons of specifics, so that's all good. <laughs> I get asked so many different questions around like different things. So one that you kind of just touched on there, and I think this is the same probably for beginners and for people who've been riding for a while. And it's a question that I get asked quite a lot is how do you get over the fear of not being able to tackle a certain obstacle? Um, so 
an example would be some a, a lady uh, messaged me recently, probably last week or the week before, and she was saying that she gets to the top of an obstacle and then she just panics and she's like, I, ca- I can't do that. Like she'll look at it and think, I can't do it, I can't do it. And one of two things will happen. She'll either ride it, but she'll ride it incredibly stiffly, make a mistake and fall off. And then she just sets the conference further back or she'll just not be able to do it. Like she'll get off and push down it. Um, my kind of advice in those situations is to build up gradually. So like if you're looking at a massive 10 foot drop, don't even attempt to that. Start off a curb and then do a one foot drop and then two foot and three foot and get more confident. But what are some tips that you've got around dealing with fear then around any different aspects of riding, usually the technical stuff? Yeah. Uh, in that moment, like if you're trying a new thing and you're not sure that you can do it, it's good to know if you have the capability. You're like, do I have the technical skills to do this? Like, if I can do a drop of one meter, then I probably can do a one and a half or two meters too, uh, if I do it properly. So the question first is, is it is the toughest thing for me the technical part, or is the toughest thing for me now the fear? Yeah. Because uh, if it's the fear and you're t- you're tackling it by not doing the technical thing uh, you're feeding your fear for it instead yeah. but if you are there and understand that you said that this person had the feeling of panic and she's thinking i can't do this and probably something like i can't do this i will hurt myself and everything will go bad and you have catastrophic th- thinking like that uh, it also led to her either riding it but riding it stiff mm-hmm. or just walking away from it and it's actually a really common thing that you ride in a different way say if you you're afraid of casing a jump maybe you're overshooting it instead just to be on the safe side you're going faster or someone that can't handle uh, the feeling of panic or the thoughts that they have like i'm bad i'm gonna crash i'm gonna die or etc and they try to get away from that feeling so they ride away from the feeling instead of riding it properly, like focusing on how to do it and how to perform. Uh, So the first thing in that moment, I would say like, notice what is happening inside, notice what is happening with the feelings and the thoughts, where are you at? And from that, you can choose your response. So you choose your reaction after that. And if you keep on choosing, like, the easy way on how to tackle the feeling and the fear and and all that, uh, maybe you're working against yourself and not towards your goal instead. Uh, so I think maybe we will get more into that afterwards. What is the, the consequences? Because there can be consequences that it makes you do the same mistake over and yeah. over again, like walking away, because it, walking away makes you not crash and die. So it's mm-hmm. a functional behavior for your survival, but it's not a functional behavior for your goal. Yeah. But since it worked, you will probably do the same thing next time. Yeah. So if it's like you're handling your panic, uh, like riding stiff, because then you can say like, well, I rode it anyways. You know that you can ride it anyways. Uh, yeah. But maybe you're riding stiff because you're ten, you're tensing up uh, and you're tensing up because you want the feelings of panic to go away. So you include your muscles instead. So it depends on what happens. Totally. So is there anything that you can do in that moment to try and help? I suppose if you know that you can do something, I'll give you a great real life example. So <laughs> as you know, I um, broke my wrist and got my cast off two weeks ago. So to start off with, I was nervous just riding on a road and turning the bike. <laughs> but that went away within 20 minutes and then I was fine. And I've gradually been building it up and doing more and more technical descents. And then yesterday on a ride, we got to a super, super steep, like over the back wheel type of descent. And I knew like I was nervous going into it. I knew I had the technical ability to do it. So I knew I could do it, first of all. But then as I was pushing up, I was just nervous. You got that knot in your stomach. And one thing that I did was, you've said it exactly yourself, I kind of accepted that that's how I felt. And I'd say probably a couple of years ago, I would have built, like, beat myself up for feeling scared and got angry at myself. But I was like, it's cool, you've broken your wrist, it's normal to be scared. And I just kind of like slowed myself down, took some deep breaths, tried to like relax my arms. 
And as I was riding into it, I was just trying to relax as much as possible. And then I ended up riding it probably 50% stiff, something like that. But I think for me, it was just taking 30 seconds to breathe deep, to try and relax and just literally just trying to relax my body. Um, is that a good technique? And do you have any other techniques that you can literally, something you can actively do before a technical section that you're scared of that you know you can do? Yeah, it's interesting that you say like it took 30 seconds just to breathe because normally we say it takes around 90 seconds uh, for the body to calm down after uh, a stress, um, like your your nervous system kicks uh, on and okay. uh, it's time for a fight or flight or freeze. Uh, and when you're in that moment, if you don't feed the feeling with thoughts like... Uh, uh, I might die or I might hurt myself and uh, I'm so scared. All of those gives new wood on the fire to feel more nervous. Okay. But if you think uh, back like a long, long time ago when we were more like uh, hunted hunters, <laughs> uh, that feeling would be like you see a lion, you get super scared and then 90 seconds after, if you survive, it will have gone away. Okay. Now, when you're out riding and you get scared of something and you keep on thinking and you keep on thinking and you keep on thinking, you keep on feeling that fear. Yeah. Uh, so by you breaking it up, uh, focusing more on like your breath and focusing on the question like, okay, so if I would ride this, how would I ride it? So you get into the doing and how how to perform instead you're not saying i have to ride this because if you say i have to ride this it's more like if i don't ride this i suck uh, okay if and that maybe increases the fear if you're saying i have to do it then you're like oh my god i have to do it that's a, that's a really interesting play on words sorry carry on and also frustration it's like you get frustrated with i i want to do this but i really don't want to and i want to do this but i really <laughs> think i might die <laughs> but you're into that like back and forth with yourself trying to feel positive trying to stay positive like I have to think positive and when I'm positive I can write this yeah but if that is a rule for you then maybe you will never feel positive <laughs> because <laughs> if you do start to feel positive then you have to write it and you're afraid of writing it yeah but if it's okay for you to be in that state feeling a bit nervous uh, but still wanting to ride it, then the question is, is it more effective for you to focus on how to perform it, how mm -hmm. to ride it, or is it more effective to you to focus on how you feel and what you think and what will take most time? Will you fix what you do or will you fix how you feel? And that's personal depending on the person, I imagine. Yeah, it's always harder to fix a situation than to fix a behavior. So. Yeah. Usually, we we try to stay in the uh, the response of such situation, like what you do with the fear and what you do with uh, your your goal. Of course, yeah. And then that's a matter of focusing on breathing, relaxing. I think what you said there on focusing on are uh, thinking about what you're focusing on. So thinking about how would I ride this, like. I think actually just thinking positive things rather than the negatives of, oh my God, I might break my arm again. I might die. I might fall off. Yeah, mm. that's really interesting. Um, mm. So we may as well carry on with this theme then. So yeah. when people do have a big crash, break the wrist and end up in a cast for 10 weeks <laughs> um, when they get back into riding it's obviously really common to be nervous to be scared um, and to have lots of emotions so what are some things what are some tips for riders who've been injured and they're getting back into riding what are some tips for them to get back up to where they were before the crash mm -hmm. Uh, as you said, and I listened to your pod about <laughs> how you tried to get back from your injury as well, uh, easing into it and uh, just like begin to ride. And uh, it, well, again, it depends on where you are in your injury. We can say like you can, you're fully recovered, so you can actually ride in the forest again and on trails. Uh, then maybe you're nervous about what if it's really not healed or is it healed am i strong enough or 
uh, can I still ride this? And oh my goodness, this is the place where I crashed. Uh, and then when you see that, you can see the pictures of how it's happening and you can feel the feelings and everything is racing. So well, for someone that gets back to that place, that will be how they feel. Yeah. And, uh, again, maybe taking a moment where if you're back at the place where you did crash, like staying there, just observing like what it looks like and observing what happens within you instead of just trying to pass it or trying to just uh, do it as quickly as possible to get it over with. You just stay just for a while to notice, okay, so this is here. This is what happened. This is how I feel about it. Uh, and um, just, just as I said, just recognize what is happening. And then you try to ease into it again. Like if I were to do this, how would I do it? Mm -hmm and get back into that. And if you've heard, well, if you've heard of, I think you've heard about the um, uh, mindfulness also, like mm -hmm. uh, when you lose your focus on something, like you're supposed to focus on your breath, but yeah. you start to think about what you're going to eat when you're finished with your mindfulness practice. <laughs> <You're> just... Been there. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be like the same thing that you do in the woods also, like you get the thoughts like, okay, this is super scary, uh, I think uh, I might hurt myself. And then you notice that, and like, okay, I hear what you say, and then you get back to where you want to be. And then you hear another thought, and then you get back to where you want to be. So you try to help your mind by just getting back to where you want to put your presence and where you want to be focused. But it's okay that the mind wanders. Of course. It sounds to me like it's very important to have an, a real... Uh attention to how you're feeling and to what emotions you're doing and I think that's something that probably myself included don't spend enough mental energy into focusing on I think I'm definitely better at that than I used to be and I'm much more aware of before say uh, five years ago if I had any kind of emotion that was negative I used to just try and push it to the back of my head and be like think positive think positive and I used to just ignore it and push it away but then that was probably when I was 19 20 I'm 26 now as I got older that kind of, um, I realized that that only brought on, I, I would try and ignore the negative thing and just focus on the positive, but then you'd kind of realize that the negative is still there. And if you don't pay attention to it, it'll just end up messing you up. So now I think I'm better at actually understanding when I've got a negative emotion and paying attention to it, and then you can help deal with it. Why is it so important for people to actually focus and pay attention to how they feel rather than just doing what I used to do and just ignoring any negative emotions? Why is that important? Yeah, uh, again, it's a good thing that you say that you used to push it away because I usually say that doing that is like shutting a door on your thoughts, but the thought starts to like knocking on the door. Okay. Instead, it doesn't go away, so it starts knocking, and you say that, like, shut up, but then it starts yelling. And then you have that bad neighbor outside your door that you really don't want to meet, but he's not leaving. <laughs> so, <laughs> there. so that would be shutting your bad thoughts out. So I think it's, um, it's a good thing that you're uh, now open to meet them, because you can have neighbors that you say hello to, but you don't invite them. You say like, hello, I don't like you, but you live there, so I see you. So that's more like having that thought. It's like, okay, I don't like this thought, maybe, but I see that I have it. So if, say like if in racing, you start to notice this is how I feel and this is how I think, maybe you also notice there is a pattern that, okay, well, I've had this feeling before. <laughs> maybe I've had this thought before. And maybe these feelings and thoughts come in a specific situation. So I know that when I'm racing, these things will come. Mm -hmm. And they are not as frightful if I know they will come. And okay. if, if I also have the open door, like, okay, you can come if you like. Maybe they won't come. So That's really interesting. And it's almost, I think a lot of people thinking to this will think very differently. Um, and I think that if people can... I think that advice is great if you sort of let in you be more open to negativity almost aren't you into negative thoughts and by opening it up and not being critical of yourself it sounds like actually you get less of those thoughts and um, 
I think that's a really, most people probably don't think in that way. I think when they get scared, I know from the messages that I get, they beat themselves up about it and they feel like they're weak and they shouldn't feel scared and other riders don't feel scared and why do I feel like this? And actually, you're taking it from a completely different approach and you're not trying to ignore those feelings. You're trying to almost focus on them more because when you do focus on them more and you know they're there, then they're easier to control. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, like other people doesn't feel like me. I am the weakest one, and everyone doing uh, mountain bike are extremely adrenaline seeking people, and they're not scared of anything. And I am the weak link. How did I even get here? Maybe I should get into knitting instead. <laughs> Keep on being negative around yourself. And yeah. Um, yeah. So inviting feelings and thoughts is. A good way because we know that we will have thoughts and feelings until the day we die so yeah. saying i don't want to think and feel is almost like saying i want to die so ropens <laughs> <laughs> having both good and and less nice feelings uh, you're more open to getting to know yourself also yeah and as i said i was racing in the um, uh, pump track world championships qualifier uh, last weekend and it's a new format for me. It was the second time I tried. And I was racing with a friend of me. And we said in the morning, neither of us said like, oh, we have any nervous thoughts. Because I, I couldn't recognize me thinking any nervous thoughts. But I really recognized <laughs> that my, my belly <laughs> was having a nervous day. Okay. I said, oh, do I need to go to the bathroom or do I need to puke? <laughs> and, and neither was necessary. But... <laughs> It's still, it's like, it can happen, like on a race day that you, you have feelings and thoughts and we were laughing in the car, like, oh, you need to puke as well, because <laughs> I can stop the car any moment, but it's, it's fine. That's really interesting. So it's actually it's paying attention to the physical symptoms as well as the mental symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. Because there are plenty of those as well. Like, yeah being tense and if you notice that you're tense well then it's the first time that you can actually choose to relax but if you don't notice that you're tense you're just gonna stay tense just be tense but if you feel what's happening like your heart is racing and your your breath is up high in your mouth and you're just like super stressed mm -hmm. if you know that well then you can bring it down yeah a lot of it's about learning yourself isn't it and learning what you tend to do when you are stressed out and when you are worried and I suppose little things like if you uh, if you're stressed in general things like snapping at your partner or mm -hmm. like you say if you feel really uptight and you feel tense or you're breathing fast or if you're getting road rage or you notice any of those things uh this is kind of on a more general sense it's about learning to recognize those things that you do and then you're like oh okay actually I do feel like that so like you said there when you're at the race I was like well I feel fine but my stomach does not feel fine <laughs> so maybe I am feeling a bit nervous and I am feeling a bit stressed so it sounds to me like the more you can learn yourself the better yeah I think for obviously it affects guys and girls but I think for guys especially it's this kind of a manly thing to hide your emotions and not talk about your feelings uh, and I've had quite a lot of guests on to talk about those kind of things we talked about like suicide and um, things like that um, one guest I had on recently so he had he used to be an armed police officer and then he had PTSD from it and he used to just hide his feelings hide his feelings hide his feelings and it got to the point where he just ended up depressed um, and a few of his colleagues um, and wider colleagues like committed suicide because in the police they just wouldn't talk about their emotions and we had him on the podcast and he was talking very much about how he's trying to get the um, the um, emergency services to talk more about their emotions so I think um, for guys especially it's about learning to get more in touch with your emotions and guys and girls are just as like emotional as each other really I think we're just conditioned that men can't talk about emotions I think that's a load of rubbish I think the more that you do talk about it and realize that it's absolutely fine to admit to being scared or to admit to being stressed or to admit to being nervous even if you're a guy and when you do say it nobody laughs at you or takes the mick out of you you realize that oh actually it's, it's okay to understand all of these emotions Mm -hmm, definitely and again if we think about the sports also uh, mm -hmm. we see that sports is usually well it's still being seen as it's masculine and uh, it's still being girls are are manly in that sense that they are brave and they are strong and everything like that so uh, if you pick that 
apart again. Maybe it's hard for athletes to talk about them having like depressed feelings and hard and hard things to go through because they are supposed to be super women and super men that are never scared and are never tired and their their motivation is always high and if your mot if you wake up one morning and your motivation is low and you feel weak and you feel depressed then you're not an athlete. And if you're not an athlete, your identity is questioned and you feel even worse. And if we still keep the stigma around like mental health and how we feel, uh, we're again, we're feeding the bad wolf. <laughs> like mm-hmm. we're, we're keeping away from even having a possibility to, to, to learn more about yourself and learn, learn about all the issues and the good things. So one thing that you said in the uh, there's a good single track uh, article which everyone should should read in my opinion. Just Google Annie's name and it'll come up. Uh, it's like it's like the first result. So I was reading through that and one thing that you talked about in that is uh, sort of um, being critical of yourself. Yeah. So I think my opinion on being self-critical is that you can use it as a strength. So if you Break your arm is a really easy example since we're talking about it. I think it's very strong to be critical of myself and be like, cause the reason that I broke my arm was I was riding and I'd rushed to get there because I was like, well, I was a bit late to get there and I wanted to get out and back before my girlfriend was home. So I was kind of rushing to get there. And then when I got there, I was rushing while I was riding. My breathing was fast. I was stiff on the bike. And what I should have done was stopped for 10 minutes and slowed myself down and slowed my breathing. But I didn't. I just kept going hard and fast. And then I made a stupid mistake mistake put my hand out and then that was it I broke my wrist uh, and the reason wasn't it was literally because I was rushing and I wasn't calm and relaxed I was trying to go too fast but I think there's definitely been some benefit in being critical of myself and almost being like you were stupid to do that next time you need to slow down um but not letting it go too far to the point where you start to hate yourself and you really beat yourself up and I think you can take that to a broader point of view of riders when they bottle it on a drop or a jump and don't do it or walk around a certain section. I think you can use being self-critical to motivate you to be better in person, but you've got to get a balance between being critical and not too critical. So what, what are your views around that? Yeah, uh, it's interesting because you say that you used a, a criticism to teach you about how you could have done maybe instead. Yeah. And, and just saying... I did this, I was stupid, I won't do it again. Another way of putting that would also be like, okay, I understand this happened because I was stressed. Mm -hmm. That is being understanding and like seeing yourself, Mm -hmm. uh, but not saying I suck as a person and I'm an idiot. Of course. (laughs) Still seeing the problem, seeing what has happened, like, okay, uh, I was stressed and this happened. Uh, And if you're more self-compassionate about that which i also talked about in that art article more understanding maybe like how you would talk to your friend so if you say your friend is the one that was stressed and crashed you wouldn't say well you're such a moron so <laughs> I'm not uh, idiot don't do that again <laughs> maybe you would say that to someone but uh, to most people say to your mom you wouldn't yeah. say that to your mother mm-hmm. you would probably say like okay, I understand you had a rough morning, it was stressful for you, and uh, when you came there, you stressed and you crashed. Uh, next time while riding, I'm going to try this instead. If I'm okay. mm, so, so you're using it in the same way as you, but you're not being critical by saying, I'm an idiot, such a moron, and etc. So you're separating the behavior or the emotion, I should say, from yourself. So just because you were stressed doesn't mean that you're an idiot. It's just that you were stressed. You're almost separating the emotions. Is that right? Yeah. It's like you're not, you're, you are not uh, the idiot, but maybe you had a stressful day or you were stressing, which is also a behavior. Stress is a behavior many, many times. Okay. Uh, and then maybe something happened during that day. I don't know. But I remember when I was working at the gym here in Örebro. And I had a, a morning shift uh, because I, someone got ill. And I was supposed to have a fitness class. And I was really stressed. And I got there. And I I put uh, one of the, ba- uh, the weights 
I was doing a squat and a push up with the weight and I yeah. pushed under my chin, <laughs> which made me <laughs> lose a tooth. <laughs> and uh, that would probably not have happened if I weren't stressed. Yeah. But uh, does it help me to say, I'm such an idiot, what a moron, and now I don't have a tooth? <laughs> would it help me more to understand that, okay, I was stressed, I'm stressed, and this is what happened. This mm -hmm. is how it feels, and this is what happened. It's the same thing, but I'm not the idiot. Of if course. You, if you're mean to people, that might not be, like, that's another thing that you say, like, okay, I'm beha behaving badly to other people. That's that's not good. But uh, when you're behaving bad towards yourself, you say it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's the strangest thing. Yeah, it is. It's almost acceptable to talk to yourself like crap, but you'd never dream about talking to other people like crap. Yeah. So, like, if you try to imagine a coach in front of a team, say a national team or, like, a children's team of, of any sport, mm. you try to imagine that person saying, you're such an idiot and you're, you're trying to be motivating that person. You're such an idiot. Don't do that. Please don't uh, repeat this ever again. And if you repeat this, you're such a crappy person yeah does it work <laughs> of course not well it's it's learning by fear then you're afraid of being that idiot again but it's not maybe the most motivating thing and definitely not uh, something that you might feel good about i think sort of taking all of that into one sentence to keep it as simple as possible um, <laughs> a really easy takeaway for people is just learning to talk to yourself like you would talk to other people yeah um, and I think that's really good. If you can kind of catch yourself and think, would I say this to my mum? Would I say this to a friend? And if you wouldn't, then maybe you're not being very positive um, and not helping yourself. I think that's a really, really good takeaway for people. So flipping that the complete other way. So in the article as well, you briefly touched on, it was when you were answering about getting back from injury. You talked about celebrating small successes as you did better. So yes, I've been able to do a press up today and then I've been able to do three press ups and then 10 and so on. Um, why do you feel it's important to celebrate those mini successes? So um, a lot of people, I mean, probably even a lot of very successful people won't celebrate. They just kind of like go from it. They do one thing, then they hit a goal. And as soon as they hit that goal, they move straight onto the next one and they don't celebrate. Um, why is it important to celebrate those mini successes as well as the big successes? I would, I would even go back again and say why would you put up goals if you can't celebrate them okay and we know that uh, breaking down big goals into small ones and reaching them is good for going the whole way mm -hmm. and if you celebrate your success you will never be sad that you had another smile it will be like yes, true. Oh, it helped but sometimes also if we take the problematic side of that it's like you celebrate one day and then you have a setback okay and if the setback comes after we celebrate it maybe you don't want to celebrate again because you mm -hmm. you're scared that you will be so disappointed and people tend to not celebrate if there is a, a risk of you being disappointed it's okay. like putting yourself down before a competition like saying well, that person and that person and that person is here. Uh, so at best, I'll be fourth. Mm. Uh, and then you self-handicap yourself, uh, not even trying. But if you set up your, your goals as uh, maybe doing the first press up or something like that, and something will probably feel good for like at least half a second when you've done that press up. Yeah. It's like, yes! And then that half second passes, and then you might be reminded that, oh crap, it's only one press up, and I should be doing 20. And when I was healthy and when I was strong, I did 30. Mm -hmm. And this will take a year for me to get back from, and I am so bad. So sometimes if, you, if you're scared of the celebration and scared of being happy for your small success, maybe it's because you don't want to feel those other things, the other feelings and thoughts that may come afterwards. Uh, so rec again, recognizing what happens to you in your getting back to injury is really 
important if you're one of those persons that can't celebrate when you move forward why is that mm -hmm. do you do not deserve it or is it not good enough or why why not celebrate for you so if you know what that is it's easier to encounter what are the benefits of celebrating well it makes you feel good <laughs> yeah that's a big one <laughs> <laughs> we know that uh well, approximately 65% uh, of athletes uh, don't, um, don't follow their uh, programs from their doctors or their physiotherapists because so in some way we, we think we know better <laughs> when we're <laughs> injured. Like, oh, well, he said, she said this, uh, but I think I might try this instead. Uh, so... Instead of thinking I might try this and try 10 different things uh, when you're rehabbing, which could actually make your rehab longer than if you followed the initial thoughts, uh, it would be better for you to talk to your physiotherapist around these are the goals for your rehabilitation. So you're involved in the rehabilitation program. And if you have thoughts that you want to do more, you tell them those thoughts and you tell them these are the things I think might be hard for me like I think I might want to do more or I think I might want to do less so when you're involved you're in less risk of being one of those 65 percent that don't do <laughs> what you're supposed to do uh, that is not really the answer to your question but uh, right, if that was good. a program that you believe in maybe the celebrations will come more easy, easily to you as well, like being happy with your progress instead. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're stuck in just, I want to be in this specific physical form, you're saying to yourself all the time, every day, I'm not good enough. I'm still not good enough. And then you're feeding your critical side again. Next okay. Step so yeah okay that makes sense so you can fuel kind of one of two sides you can fuel the criticism and that negative thoughts or you can feel the positive which is going to drive you on so celebrating small and big successes is just one way of fueling the positive side rather than the negative yeah. that's really cool I like it I've got some uh, I know you saw earlier I'm just looking at my phone now um I asked on Instagram for some specific question uh questions from people of what they sorry what they struggle with most when it comes to the mental side of mountain biking so I've got a couple up here um so one person has said that they struggle with the disappointment of not doing well in a race mm -hmm. what have you got around that <sighs> If you're not doing well in a race, I think I'm going to guess here that you're thinking about the results uh, more than you're thinking about how you performed. And it depends on what are your goals uh, from the beginning and what is the most important for you. Uh, when you're further away from your race, like say in the off season, uh, goals around results may be helping you to uh, go to the gym or do that extra training etc but when you're closer to the competition uh, the kind of goals that you want to have are more uh, oriented around your performance like how you race and what you do and those will help you more uh, in coming closer to your actual result goal also because if you stand at the start line and just think like, I want to be the number one, I want to be the number one, I want to be the number one. And then on the first lap, you recognize that you're in 10th position. What happens? Well, yeah. It's disappointed and it may be you lose speed because you are disappointed or you're giving up or whatever might happen to you. But if you're on the starting line thinking about the, the performance, like how you want to do the race, like, I want to be the fastest, I want to try to go the fastest possible in the uphills, or I'll be the, uh, I'll be smooth in the downhills, or, or whatever, like, how you race will help you come closer to your result goal in the end. So I, th I think that person might have to think about their goal-setting strategies. So 
Excuse me. So on that, that brings us perfectly into one of my other questions. You, um, you in the article, you had three different types of goals. I've written them down. Uh, I can't find it. I'm sure you'll remember. There were three different types of goals anyway, wasn't there? There was like an, a result goal, a process goal, is that right? Yes. process goal or progress goal. Uh, the process is, is even more in the, the, the doing. So if you see a process, it's always something that you do. Okay. A goal that is result-oriented is something that happens or has happened. So you will have a result, either either a good or a bad. You don't how uh, it doesn't matter how you behave. You will always have a result. Yeah. But if you have the um, the process mo- uh, goal uh, or the um, I'm thinking in Swedish now. That's why I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> 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 uh, if you're in the process and if you're in the doings and you know what are the uh, what are the process goals that takes me towards my big goal okay so, say if i want to learn how to do a manual mm-hmm. uh, i need to know uh, that um okay one part of that like a process goal would be uh, try to get my front wheel off the ground. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that would be the first thing. And uh, then, well, if you're technical, like remembering to have your finger on your back brake and etc. And like maybe try to go over once and step out of your pedals and like those kinds of goals to get closer. Okay. Uh, if I focus on just like I want to nail it, I want to nail it. it should be I just want to I just want to do the manual today. It won't help me very much I need to know how to and what to so with that would you make it specific to day to day so that's a good example so the result goal would be I want to be able to do a 30 second manual that might be a goal then the process goal would be would you make it specific so would it be okay I'm going to practice for 10 minutes today on getting my bum right down to the back wheel or on making sure I cover that is that how you would kind of practically use that then yeah, that is super good that you break it down so you have a daily goal, like this is what I'm going to do now, right now. Yeah. So if you're doing that and you know, like, I'll give it 10 minutes today, then you have it like the first part of the process. And it's the gotcha. same racing also, like I'm going to stand up in every uphill. Well, then you can do that. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So it's a real practical sort of process goal that you set I like what was the what was the third one so there was uh i've got too many notes this is why i've written too many sorry go on <laughs> it's the performance goal uh, okay and how you perform and uh, the performance is sort of the uh, the the sum of your process uh, so if you say like afterwards after a race it's like were my performance good uh, well did I do my uh, standing up in every uphill or did I, uh, did I, did I give up when I wanted to give up or did I keep on going when I wanted to give up? If I kept on going when I wanted to get up, uh, g- give up, <laughs> well, then maybe my performance was good okay. in the race. So if I don't have anything less to give after a race, well, the result might still be not what I wanted, but my performance couldn't have been better. I could okay. not perform better this day. This is what I had. Uh, so performance is based on how you do your race or how you do your training, etc. Not so what, from other people. Okay. So, yeah, I understand because the result is reliant on other people. You yeah. might do amazingly, but somebody rode better and they're a better rider than you right now. And that's how that is. And um, what's an example of a performance goal then? So I can see that the result goal would be um, do a 30 second. Oh, come first in a race. So the result goal could be come th- first in a race. I understand the process. So that could be, right, I'm going to eat three healthy meals a day. I'm going to do five weight sessions a week. I'm going to do X, Y, Z. What would be a performance goal? What's an example of one? I want to be so tired that I don't want to pedal uh, another meter okay yeah great i get it 
Yeah. So you're literally setting a goal for how well you want to perform or how much effort almost you're putting in on the day. Yeah. That's really cool. And that does a big loop back to the question from the guy on Instagram because then you can focus on he's obviously as you said yourself he's focusing in purely on the result and if he sort of said right okay well I didn't get the position that I wanted to do but I came away and I was absolutely exhausted I put the effort in that'll make him feel a bit better about himself and his result yeah maybe or maybe not it depends on how important that uh, result goal is for the person also yeah but it's um, it gives you more of a perspective around racing than just the result, because uh, you cannot when you go home from that race, you cannot keep on working on the result because you yeah. want to keep on working with your process and um, performance goals. Of course, I really like that. I think that's a great way for people to goal set because it's so easy to. I've I've never really heard of the performance goal, so I talk quite a lot about setting big goals and then breaking them down. So if you want to ride 100 miles, first of all, set a goal of, right, I'm going to ride 20 miles this month, 40 miles next month, 60 miles a month after, and breaking it down like that. And then breaking it down into the process of how to do that, like that's something that I teach. But I've never heard of the performance goal before, so I like that. I think it's another aspect that I like a lot. Um, and it's much more reliant on effort rather than how well you're doing, and I think that's useful for people. Yeah. Cool. Let me see if there's any other questions that we haven't covered. Okay, yeah, here's one. So he said that his biggest struggle with the mindset side of things is the motivation to get out on the bike when he has nobody to ride with. Yeah, I have that problem too. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> uh, it was my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you sent it in. You just made a profile. Uh, my name is James. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but sorry. Uh, yeah, it's harder. Say it's harder for me to go out training when I don't have anyone to train with. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and the goal is, I guess, to get out and ride. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, in one way, you want to say like, well, what is the problem? Uh, because it, you want to know like okay uh, it's easier to get out with a friend but is it impossible for me to go out alone uh, well it's not impossible probably uh, but if if i know what i want to ride maybe it's easier uh, if i know where all my gear is maybe it's easier if i know at what time i want to ride it's easier but if i don't know anything about the preparations because usually you can answer these questions when you go out with a friend like okay we'll meet up there we'll go that ride and uh, see you uh, this day this time okay uh, but when you go out alone it's like well, maybe i'll go riding and if i get a friend that would be fun and when that friend responds no i can't do it you start to think like ah maybe i can't either and maybe i don't want to and blah, this day is not fun uh, so if, if you prepare for riding and you prepare for yourself and giving yourself a good start, it might be easier. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it depends on what you do. And if it's hard, say for me, it's hard to feel that, oh, it's such a good day for a loner ride. Yay! <laughs> uh, that rarely happens. But um, if I put music on, and I have my gear ready to go, it feels easier for me again, like start to thinking. And uh, if I know like, okay, it's not fun to go alone, but this place is really fun to ride. Well, I ride that place then. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's again in your preparations and, and what you do. So ruminating on the couch on how boring it will be to go alone is not helpful. Maybe standing up, listening to music and moving towards going out will help i'm laughing because that's like the I've, I've written quite a few articles like on facebook and in my daily emails about that kind of thing and i've sort of written a few times about a set process you can do so when you're tired and you cannot be bothered riding especially on your own and um, then i say right break it down into really small goals so the first one for me is always make a coffee because i love coffee and caffeine helps wake me up and put a riding video on 
because how hard is it to sit with a coffee watching a riding video? It hardly takes any effort. But you've kind of one step closer than what you were doing before. And the caffeine gives me a bit of a buzz. And then the riding video, I hear the sounds of riding and the whoops and it gets me excited and I get a little bit of emotion. And then I always say a really good second step, even if you're not going to ride, is to go and put your riding gear on. Because I find as soon as I get the feeling of my shorts on and my jersey, um, that just spikes the riding emotions and instantly I start to wake up more. And you said then about standing up and listening to music and you'll probably agree it's a lot easier to get motivated when you're moving around a little bit and when you've got something to break you out of that state so it's good it's it's good for me that you kind of said what I say it's very similar to the kind of answers that I give to that uh, I think one that I'd add as well to that whole thing is sometimes it's hard to get your head around going out for a six hour solo ride because it just seems so long excuse me bash the mic scared anybody there um, going out for a six hour ride it seems so long but if you can say right i'm just going to do 20 minutes that's a lot easier to get your head around and sometimes you might go out do 20 minutes and then come home that's fine but you'll probably find when you're out there you've kind of tricked yourself into getting out there uh, is that something that you would say is beneficial what you're doing is actually what we just discussed around the the goal settings i think so if you have that original goal of doing six hours that is your result goal come home with a six hour on your watch but if yeah. you go to more of the process and everything that we spoke about, like just going out and riding, then you're back in your performance goals. Like, I just want to go out there and then see if I can break a sweat <laughs> or yeah. anything like that. And it helps you towards your goals. So maybe it's easier if you're there to do six hours than if you're on the couch. Yes. <laughs> Whatever helps you getting started, yeah. That's really cool. And I think one thing I'd probably add to it as well that just came into my head is those goals, the result goals, all of the all three of the goals kind of work with this is understanding why it's so important to do it. Um, because if you understand your why, if you it's a real life example. So if you not for me personally, but for one of my clients, if you want to get pregnant you need to lose weight. So if you just need to lose weight because it'll make you feel a little bit better or you need to lose weight because you're trying to get pregnant and that baby's going to change your life, the, the motivation levels are completely different. So I'd say for whatever your goals are, understanding the real reason behind it. And um, so like one of my motivators to ride and it is unique to me, but I've obviously got X amount of followers, like 200,000 people who follow MTB Fitness, and I'm kind of the head of that. So if I'm telling everybody to go ride, but I sit at home eating chocolate, <laughs> that, that really makes me feel guilty. And I know that when I turn up to that social ride in three months, I need to be pretty near the front of the pack. Like I, I, I wouldn't say that I need to be the fittest, but I need to be in the top 5%, the top 1% <laughs> of those riders. Otherwise, like every god is going to be like, he's a fraud. <laughs> and that really motivates me to ride. So I understand that that's you uniquely personal to me but when I'm feeling that I can't be bothered riding I will think about that and I'll think about you literally just wrote a post this morning telling people to go ride so I need to live by that so I think everybody has something that motivates them personally and if you understand what that is that massively helps your motivation yeah yeah and motivation is a huge topic so I think that would take hours and hours if we were to go into moderation but yeah that can be podcast too. <laughs> <laughs> what you described actually is, again, it's a, a fear of being uh, like not as good as other people think that you are. Uh, and it's, it's motivating by fear. Uh, and it, it works. I wouldn't be a coach that used that towards children because it's not nice. Uh, and it's... <laughs> Uh, you more want to, if you can help uh, your motivation by setting, uh, re rephrasing it, like I, I want, want to inspire people. Exactly, like I want to inspire people, and like I I want to live by how I I I teach to others or something like that. So so it's a goal of wanting and not a goal that you want to like run away from you stay away from being slow stay away from being the snail in the pack like please don't <laughs> grow i want to be the lighter one going uphill whatever those things are uh, i would try to rephrase them as something that you want to work towards instead of working away from okay yeah 
That's really interesting. I like it. I will do that. Next time I can't be bothered riding, which I think will be for a while because I'm just loving being on the bike again. <laughs> but, but next time I can't be bothered riding, which definitely happens, I'll try that. I like it. Rephrasing it to a more, yeah, you here's what I want rather than here's what I don't want. Yeah. I like it. So that's been, I've really, really enjoyed that. So I think probably two things to finish with. Um, the first thing would be, where can people find out about you? So I think I saw in the article that people can work with you online if they want. So I presume can they book a Skype consultation or h- how does that work? If people want to work with you and learn more about you, tell tell me what they can do. Uh, usually we work on Skype uh, since uh, most of my clients don't live in Örebro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Skype is a good way or, or whatever. Uh, it could be Hangouts or any other app that you can use. use. It's usually easier when you can use a camera because sometimes we paint things and write things so we remember them because I know that if we didn't record what we were talking about now uh, none of us would probably remember a lot of this afterwards yeah Uh, so it's good with the camera Uh, and um, in my website it's in Swedish but uh, I work in Swedish and in English uh, not any other language (laughs) unfortunately Uh, but yeah no that's really cool so uh what i'll do i'll link the website so you don't need to worry about remembering it just click the uh whatever podcast that you're listening to this just go to the description and it'll be right at the beginning i'll make sure i put annie's um website on there you can as well if you don't speak swedish like me um then you can probably find some sort of google translate i think if you just google website translator then google's got their own version and you can type it in it can ask you what language from and to and then when you go onto the website it will put it in english for you and um, so that'd be a good way if you want to work with annie but obviously you can't understand the swedish just do that through google and you can um, you can do it that way and i'll link the social media channels as well so i know you're on instagram are you on facebook or twitter or any of the others uh yeah not on twitter but on facebook and instagram perfect same as me Cool. So the last question, I like to ask the guests to, here's another putting you on the spot. <laughs> I like to ask the guests to uh, just leave with something that you want to tell the audience. It can be absolutely anything. So kind of like a nice parting thought. Um, there's no focus for it. It can be whatever you would like to finish the podcast with. Over to you. Okay. So where is mine? Um, get to know yourself and be interested in what you feel and what you think. Uh, it's it's fun when you learn more about yourself in different situations and be open and less critical about how you feel and what you think that's perfect i like it and that has been a running theme through the last hour so that's brilliant i like it nice way to end well thank you so much for taking the time i really appreciate it and i know people will love listening to this and hopefully we can get one for another one and we'll dive into motivation by the sound of it (laughs) yeah yeah i have i have book here for you to read oh brilliant <laughs> <laughs> what's the book i'm gonna have to put it up now <laughs> <laughs> good yeah uh, it's uh, this one is actually <laughs> in in swedish but it's about the self-determination theory uh, oh, okay. and uh, it's uh, it's really interesting uh, when it comes to motivation so self-determination theory i would say perfect i will try and get that in english i like it i'm sure it'd be in english somewhere thank yeah. you very much it's been brilliant thank chatting you. to you and i will uh, see you on the next one thanks so much yeah see you <laughs> thank you okay that's done i will just hit stop record